Pythagoras tells, we're going to go through one of the uh, revision quizzes that I've set up for you. You can do this quiz while watching this video, or you can do it uh, maybe on paper and then do the quiz afterwards. Um, but again, I need you to understand why the answers are uh, what they are for each question, not just the answer to each question. So you can either go to my Google Classroom, if you're on my Google Classroom, um, and go to the classwork, and this is the July revision multiple choice questions. Um, or alternatively, what you can also do is um, you can actually go, if you're not on my Google Classroom, I will put a link in the YouTube video as well to go to this Google quiz, and you can do the Google over there, but it's this link over here. Now, let's get to the first question. Ladies and gentlemen, so what we have over here is um, the first question, the microscopic space between two adjacent neurons is either an axon, a dendrite, a synapse, or cell body. In this case, it's a synapse. The synapse is the space or um, the connection between one neuron and the next neuron. So when one neuron attaches to a next neuron, that's when we have a synapse. And specifically, we have a synaptic cleft or synaptic gap over there. And there's a chemical message going from one neuron to the next. So it's important knowing the structure of your neuron, knowing each part, and knowing the function of each part of the neuron. Next question. The following is a list of functions performed by different organs in an organism. Protection, gases exchange, nutrition, and excretion. I want to know which one of the following combinations refers to the functions performed by parts of an amniotic egg. Okay, so what happens inside an amniotic egg? that does these functions, and are all these functions present in an amniotic egg? So, yes, they are. One is the outer shell provides protection, so does the fluids on the inside provide for shock, shock absorption. Then, we also have my Allen toy and the shell for gases exchange. We also have nutrition provided by the yolk, provides nutrition. And excretion is also then uh, what will happen is it will also, excretion will then happen by uh, into the, the chorion, which is also involved in gaseous exchange. So the correct answer for this one is one, two, three, and four which is the last answer over here. Next question. An investigation was done to determine the effect of alcohol on the time, on the reaction time of a person. Reaction time was measured by the time it took to catch a ruler, and then the procedure was as follows. The person's reaction time was first measured in bright light. So first bright light, then, they given a person 200 mils of alcohol to drink. So that's what we're testing for. We want to see what is the reaction time and the effect of the alcohol. Then, after 15 minutes, the reaction time of the person was measured in the second time while he or she was in dim light. Now we have a problem because now we have a problem with the variability of my experiment because am I testing for alcohol or am I testing for light and if is light not going to affect the result and yes it is 
10 measurements were recorded each time. So 10 measurements were recorded. That's good because it increases the reliability of my results and an average was calculated. But now the problem over here is the validity. And so this question is about what makes a, what makes a test, an experimental test or investigation valid or what makes it reliable. And in this case, we have, have a problem with the validity of the test. How was the validity of the test decreased by different light levels? Okay, so the reaction time was measured at different light conditions. Okay, so let's see why the others aren't uh, decreasing the, the validity. Ladies and gentlemen, the person reaction time was measured in the, um, in the absence of alcohol. Now I wanted to test alcohol. So I need to have a control and experiment. So that's right. There's no problem with that. Reaction time was measured by the time it took to catch the ruler. No, that's a perfect way of getting reaction time. And then only 10 measurements were recorded. No, this makes it more reliable, but just because the results are reliable doesn't mean they are valid. So this question is about reliability and validity of the investigation. Then, which one of the following, let me just move this diagram a bit so you can completely see this diagram because it might be a bit out of your screen. There we go. Which one of the following represents the correct combination of visual defects, its nature, and the corrective measure? Okay, so we take a look at cataracts first. So when we take a look at cataracts, yeah, cataracts, curvature of the lens is uneven. No, that's not about the curvature of a lens, cataracts. Cataracts, we find we get is the whitening of the lens, as we see over here. And it's because of denaturation of proteins um, inside the lens. And that's why it becomes cloudy, similar to what egg whites become white, uh, from clear to white when you cook it. The same happens to the proteins inside the lens. And it's normally because of um, things like... Um, fatty, uh, certain fatty acids like cholesterol inside your body, inside your blood, that causes this. So that can't be right. Okay, so that is immediately takes that one out of the equation. People then, uh, the next one says short sightedness, okay, lens cannot become less convex. Okay, so there's your short sightedness, near sighted, we also call it. And it cannot become less convex. You can see it's nice and fat over there. And because the lens is nice and fat, the focus is in front of the retina instead of on the retina. And so I can correct that by having a biconcave. Concave, just, there's a concave lens, biconcave lens. And it corrects it by throwing the image right onto the retina. And so this one is correct. No problem with that one then. Okay, so the answer is most probably be B, but let's take a look at the rest. Astigmatism. Lens cannot become more convex. Okay, the problem with astigmatism is not necessarily the lens, but it's actually a problem with the, um, the front of the lens, in front of the lens, with, uh, when we take a look at, um, and the eyeball being too too narrow. And so the focus doesn't exactly fall onto the retina. So the problem with astigmatism is not the, the lens that is a problem. It's actually the eyeball shape and the front of the eyeball shape that might be the problem. Um, and so that is not uh, the correct answer there. Then we go to long-sightedness, and it says lens becomes cloudy and opaque. No, that is, of course, long-sightedness would, of course, be um, 
uh, sorry, a lens becoming cloudy and opaque would of course be my cataracts. Okay, so, and long sightedness has to do with the, the lens not becoming thicker or more bulged out. Um, and so we have a focus falling behind the retina and not, and not on the retina. And we correct that by having a biconvex lens. So the correction for long sightedness is correct here. But of course, the nature of the defect is wrong. So our correct answer in this case was B. It was short sightedness. Lens cannot become less convex. And we correct it by having a biconcave lens. Next question. The graph below shows the curvature of the human lens. So the lens can become uh, more convex or less convex. And so when viewing objects at different distances, which one, uh, one of the following objects is closest to the human eye. So this has to do, of course, with what we call accommodation of the lens. So the closer an object is, and if it's less than six meters away from you, what happens is the lens will become more convex. And when something moves more than six meters away or further away from you, the lens will become less convex or thinner. And you have to know that whole procedure. Please, that little rhyme. You have to know why and what makes the lens go thinner or thicker. The suspensory ligament um, together with the, uh, um, with the muscles that is pulling at the top and the bottom, pulling the chorion forward and so forth. You need to know that little rhyme, but we're not going to go through this now. Now we just need to know about the thickness of the lens, ladies and gentlemen. So I need my lens to be nice and thick to be able to see an object close by, and the lens is the thickest at number two, and so that will be the correct answer is number two. Next question, we take a look at some genetics. And in this genetics question, what we have over here, let me just move this diagram again so you get all the complete diagrams and see everything. That little Punnett square we have there. And it's always good to draw yourself a little Punnett square when you do genetics questions. Even if you're not required to draw the Punnett square, still draw it, please. So it will help you to work out everything. So it asks us, the diagram below shows the blood types of two parents. Um, Daddy was O. So if Daddy was O, now I need to think. Okay, so he's got the recessive allele. And so if Daddy was O, he would be the genotype of II. And then, the only possible blood types of the offspring for the first generation of F1s are also, Daddy is II. Okay, and so he's going to pass on to his offspring. He can only pass on an I. So we're going to put it there on the funnel square, a small letter I, small letter I. Mommy, mommy is then um, A, uh, C's blood group A, but we don't write it like this. We actually write it as follows, so let me erase that. Mommy would then be a capital I, and there we have a, a superscript A. And she can possibly be either for the second gene, because she has, has one dominant at least. So for the second one, she can be small letter I, or she can be over there, capital I, subscript capital A. So depending on that, let's take a look at the possible genotypes of the kids, the offspring. There we go. And that's going to be 
is that that can be no possibility otherwise. So that will be both of these will be blood group A, okay? Because A is dominant over O, and then over here it can either be that, or there's a possibility of it being that. So it's either one of these two, and same goes for this possible child over here. Okay, so in this case, the blood group can either be A or it can be O. So that one is the correct answer. They can either be blood group A or blood group O. They can't be blood group B because then it would have showed up in either mom or dad. So that's not a possibility. But there is a possibility that mommy could have been either I capital A, I capital A, or she could have been I capital A, or and small letter I. So she could have contained the gene for the O gene, although phenotypically it wouldn't show because the blood group A is dominant over the blood group O. Okay, so over here um, is a bit of a history question, and it's on genetics. And it asks us the structure of DNA was determined by using x ray pictures produced by. Now, be careful here. DNA structure was um, the theory of the double helix of DNA, was done by Watson and Crick. But that's not the question. They ask, who took the x-ray pictures that they used to determine the structure? And this, it was this lady over here. It was Rosalind Franklin. And it's quite an, and here's the picture that she took, and it's a helix as seen from the top. And when they, Watson and Crick, saw that picture, they knew, okay, they're onto something, it had to be a helix. But, and the interesting story about this is that Maurice Wilkins, who's not even pictured over here, Maurice Wilkins was in charge of the research that Rosen and Franklin was doing, and he, without her consent, gave the picture, showed the picture, to Watson uh, and Crick, James Watson and Francis Crick. And then later, for their research, James Watson and Francis Crick actually got the Nobel Prize for their research. Rosen and Franklin never got the Nobel Prize because, unfortunately, the Nobel Prize cannot be awarded posthumously and she died before the Nobel Prize was given. Otherwise, it probably would have been given to her as well. It's a very sad story there, but let's get on to the next question. Brown eye color in humans is dominant over blue eye color. A man with brown eyes marries a woman with blue eyes. They have a son with brown eyes and a daughter with blue eyes. We can then conclude. Okay, so that means that mommy can only give blue eyes. So small letter B for blue. Dad has brown eyes, so he's got to have a capital B. But he passes on a recessive gene to his daughter, so it's got to be small letter B as well. And he'll have brown eyes. But phenotypically, because he's got the gene and it's dominant, but he's got the blue eye gene as well, and so he could pass it on. Although he has brown eyes, he can have kids with blue eyes. And so let's cross these capital B, small letter B, capital, no, small letter B, small letter B, capital B, small letter B, and small letter B, and small letter B. So let's take a look at the, the options. The man is not the true father of the children. No, we see it, it can be. The man is heterozygous for eye color, and that's the correct answer. He's heterozygous. Heutero meaning different, zygous, uh, different genes, different allele for the same gene. Okay. Eye color is not a sex linked one. 
although remember that color blindness is, and both parents are homozygous. No, they can't be homozygous. Daddy had to be heterozygous. Second last question of this quiz. A possible explanation for an observation that can be tested is known as a, the moment I said possible explanation, I knew it was an hypothesis. And so know the definition of a, an hypothesis and a theory and a law very well to be able to answer this question or know it for the terminology questions. And, and this is all to do with the scientific method and it's also important in terms of the scientific laws or theories um, that they had with regards to your section on evolution and human evolution. So let's just quickly go through what each one is. So an hypothesis is a possible answer to a question. I don't really know, but I think I know, and so I, I give a possible answer. Then I test, I take that hypothesis and I test the hypothesis by doing an experiment and I come up with a theory because most of the time, um, when I test it, my hypothesis is true. And then, if all of the time, without a doubt, if all of the time I find that it is true, my hypothesis was true, it becomes, or the theories are true, it becomes a law. There's no exceptions. And then we call it a scientific Next question, last question. So, let me just move my diagram a bit over here so we have the correct answers. Okay, then, the graph below shows changes in the amount of DNA present in a cell over a period of 36 hours. Which one of the following parts of the graph represents interphase? Okay, so what happens during interphase? Okay, so replication. So we're going to double up on the amount of DNA during, um, during interface, or nothing happens. Um, so let's just take a look at what happens in the sections over here. So this is nothing happens. Then we go from diploid to um, tetraploid. And from tetraploid, uh, so we go from 2N to 4N. So replication happened there. And then we half it. So if we half it back to 2N, this could be meiosis 1 or mitosis. But then it happens again. And so I know it's meiosis because we go from 2N to 1N. This is my hostess too. Okay, so what where is replication happening? Over there from T up to V. And so A is the correct answer.